So it's great to be able to um, formally introduce to you now Simon and Amanda from um, Phil's Hill. Um, the session that we did a few weeks ago now for Women in Wholesale uh, was, was, was uh, I, I guess, the, the, the standout in terms of really helping give um, useful solutions and some insight um, into one of the biggest challenges that we've been grappling with over the last 12 to 18 months. So it's brilliant to be able to welcome back Simon and Amanda today to talk in a bit more detail about how Phil's Hill um, have really helped and supported their employees through these challenges. Um, so without further ado, um, I will open the, um, the session and, um, and, and, and ask you, I guess, Simon, the pandemic has created a, a real accelerated pressure on colleagues regarding mental health. So how have Phil's Hill approached this? What specific, specifically have you done that you can share Listen, I think the pandemic has given everybody um, an opportunity to really understand their business and their people more. You know, it certainly allowed us to target what's working, but more importantly, what actually matters to us as a business. You know, we kind of want to be the worst in class in things that don't matter and the best in class that, you know, in things that matter the most. And I think, you know, well-being and mental health um, came top of that list. Our focus has been really to, to improve our employee and colleague experience at the same pace as our customer experience. Um, and those two things for us have to come hand in hand. So I guess it started at the very big beginning of, of the pandemic where hygiene confidence was, was absolutely critical um, to our colleagues first and foremost, knowing that coming to work, they're going to be safe. And I think every wholesaler has invested a huge amount of time, effort and resource in that. But, but certainly as a, as a board and as a group, we believed that we had to create a vision for the business that not only gave hygiene confidence on the physical side, but actually mental confidence that the business um, is stable, that, that people's jobs are stable, actually being able to, to show the vision of the business and the direction of travel. So we, we worked incredibly hard um, right in the middle of pandemic last June, um, and we built a 10-year strategy, um, which seems a crazy thing to do when, when you're in the middle of so many moving parts, but, but that was the reason for it. Um, we came out of that process, we created a 10-year target, a three-year picture and a one-year plan. The board um, presented the vision to the managers. The managers then were asked to tell everybody what they'd done in the last 10 years to get us to our targets on the, on the 20, you know, in 2031. And, and that seemed to, to be, be very engaging because the management went across all departments to really, you know, what will we be doing? How will we be delivering to our customers in 2031? What will we be doing for our suppliers? Um, and, and essentially, everyone was involved in that process, everyone in the business. And, you know, the opportunity I had was to, to present that vision to the business and give everybody real confidence in the direction of travel, that their jobs are going to be safe. There is going to be longer term, you know, more jobs required in the future and have everyone with that kind of understanding. So essentially our one year plan has been broken into four 90 day bursts where every manager has five objectives every single manager has one objective which is all about well-being and mental health um, and that's consistent so you know i think building a good platform into you know well-being and mental health making sure that it's part of your strategy not just a bolt on to the side of the strategy i think has been a really really important thing and has helped us build momentum um, with that. We've set up, um, you know, a, a well-being team, which Amanda will talk about. Um, but similarly, we've trained over 20 mental health first aiders. Now, maybe just pass across to Amanda just to, to give you a, a little bit of context about what the mental health first aiders do and also the roles and responsibilities of some of the, the, the well-being team. Hi there. Thanks, Simon. So Simon says, we've trained over 20 mental health first aiders. We also have a few ready to go on a, a, another course. Um, we have a wellness team, which is made up of 14 individuals. Um, and we meet in the first week of every month. Um, so we just met this Tuesday, for example, and we plan for the month ahead. So we're planning for July, which is in line with our wellness calendar that we have. Um, so that's for breast cancer awareness. So we're planning for that. Um, but also within the group, um, it says a lot about our culture because 
our CEO, Simon, and directors would come to these meetings, but a lot of the people, or a few should I say, felt that they would be better if they weren't present at all meetings. So they, they felt confident to speak up and say that. And um, so that also says a lot about Simon and the board that they don't want to hinder the process and they don't want everything to go as well as it can and people to feel comfortable. So that does say a lot about our culture. Um, but going back to the team, so the wellness team, um, and they are all mental health first aiders. Um, they, they, they take responsibility for seven key elements and our seven key elements are um, culture, sleep, exercise, meaningful activity, i.e. hobbies, um, social interaction, um, helping others and stress management. Um, I can talk a wee bit more about that in a minute, Claire, if you're happy for me to continue just going into the elements. Yeah, no, that'd be fantastic. Okay, great. So if we look at culture, so a couple of things that, that have worked well for us. Um, so under our culture bracket, it's been really popular. We do blogs, employee wellbeing blogs. So that's where our employees will discuss their own journey um, and they share it. It's shared through um, a, a private portal that only our employees can access. It's all confidential. We do it through a QR code. So for example, in line with our calendar, which is June, which is a men's mental health awareness, we have um, a male employee sharing his uh, journey with bipolar. Um, I can say for the ones that we, we have um, shared so far, they're really powerful and really worthwhile thinking about and implementing in your business. In terms of um, under sleep, we have the world's top um, yeah. sleep specialist doing a Zoom at the end of the month. We've had a lot of engagement in that one because I think sleep is something that a lot of people struggle with. And um, it's something again to consider. Under exercise, we do weekly boot camps and they're still popular, even though the gyms are open, people are still really interested. Um, we have just finished our May step challenge and um, we had a target of 8.5 million steps, but um, we actually smashed the target, 16.5 million, um, and our business is donating to a mental health charity. The real pleasing thing here is people met a lot of personal milestones, they achieved them. But I'll give you a couple examples. So someone who lives on their own, who, you know, keeps themselves to themselves, quite in, they admitted they were quite lonely in lockdown, and reached out to a friend and said, they're doing a step challenge and work, and they go out three times a week, and they've been going out walking, and that's getting them out. Um, another um, employee said, you know, this is brilliant. It's really helped me because I had a breakdown of communication with my son, and we weren't talking in lockdown. But he loves sport, he loves athletics. So I said, well, I'm doing a step challenge. Why don't we go walking? So they've been going out every other night walking and they've been talking and it's really helped their relationship. You know, one of our values is being proud of the Phil Shell family. And I just can honestly say we really are. This one has really hit home um, and it's really helped in so many ways. Um, helping others, so we've got a letter pick uh, booked this Saturday. And um, we're working with one of our key stores and our local council. So again, that's getting people out in the community with company, fresh air, helping the environment. But again, we, were, we jumped on the back of the feedback that some people were feeling lonely. So it's just that company part was a big one for us. Um, and the other big one that we found that's been really helpful is under the stress management element is COVID testing. So we um, have COVID testing on site um, every week. And we feel that that's really helped with stress for employees. The feedback is that they feel comfortable coming to work. I know things are easy, but we are still continuing as a business to offer that and support our employees because it's really important for them to be feel supported, their families, their friends, with us being a business for families. We feel that this is a really good way to show and demonstrate that and just really do the right thing. Um, but yeah, so that that's that's just some bits and pieces that we've been doing. Um, I'll hand, you, I'll hand you back to you, Claire. Fantastic. Thanks, Amanda. Simon, I was reflecting on what you said at the, at the start, which is which is really a really useful prompt, and I guess for, for, for every business. Um, we know that the pandemic has created a level of ambiguity, and what, you, what you've done in creating that sort of stable vision is, is reduce some of the ambiguity, isn't it? it, it it's put into place some controls that help people feel that they are a bit more in control. So that's that's a fantastic tip, I guess, where when the world is slightly chaotic and uncertain, if as a business you can create that certainty 
um, a bit of a sanctuary and give all of your employees the ability to feel that level of confidence um, and, and, and the belief that they have in, in, in your company and, and the work that they do, then that's a, that's a huge that's a huge positive for them in, in a world that is a little bit uncertain. I think that's a, a really useful top tip, really useful tip. Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, the source of most of our stress evolves around our ability to pay our bills um, you know, as, as you know, individuals. And, and if you can take that off the table, <laughs> Um, you're kind of removing one of the most difficult variables to manage. So, you know, I think that's that's important. And listen, the other thing that's important is, is making sure that, you know, how do we retain great people? How do we recruit great people into this business? And, and we see this as a mechanism for actually retaining and, and recruiting people, not just how much we pay on an hourly basis, but, but actually it goes deeper than that, you know, many, many people are looking to work for companies who genuinely care about them. And, and that's something that, that, that we take very, very seriously here because we do, as Amanda mentioned, as a business for families, five generations, we've got 26 families that work in this business. Family is important to us and, and you know, it's important to our colleagues and similarly to our customers. Many of them are family businesses themselves. Really, really, really useful context. Um, so, so Amanda, you mentioned a few ideas. So how, how specifically have you built wellness into your strategy and how, how did you go about almost recruiting the, 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 the wellness team that, that you spoke about? How, how, did that, how did that whole piece come together? So initially, um, we, we sent out communications of, of anybody interested in joining um, as mental health first aiders. And as Simon mentioned, we were inundated. Um, so we... We then they, they were trained and we then did further training um, for these um, mental health first aiders and then we started up a team so initially um, we were meeting every other week um, and became a bit we were trying to do too much so then we structured it better where we broke it down into the elements the seven elements and we had responsibility um, I chair most of the meetings but we share that out so some people it will not suit they, they, they won't want to chair the meeting but others may so we offer that out and we're helping each other and supporting that way. But we then, um, we, the fact it's all coming together, as Simon mentioned, our strategy um, and everyone having a, um, a target and a 90 day burst objective. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have a, our um, business improvement manager who regularly does toolbox talks. So he'll go, he'll speak to the warehouse, speak to the operations and office. And they, they know he's coming to talk about business and new things that are happening in the business. But he's used this as part of his uh, 90 day burst and he is uh, attending Toolbox Talks to talk and support the mental health first aiders at the Toolbox Talks to talk about wellbeing. And he said, you know, they, they come and they see me come and they expect me to be talking about uh, uh, something new in the business, but it's actually wellbeing and they think, wow, that's great. And he's got a lot from it. So it's actually everybody pulling together our toolbox talks work really well, but we always have a mental health first aider attend um, and so, or someone from the wellness group. Um, but as I say, I think the structure is really important to your group. So initially we were just not, we were just trying to do too much. We we're so enthusiastic and it was becoming a burden on people as well. There were people were trying to do too much. They had a day job to do, but now it's more structured um, and we really enjoy it every month. The meeting we had on Tuesday was really, it was really good. Um, and we feel we're really productive. We know what we're doing for the month ahead. And we take learnings and experiences from each other. So Claire, I think it's probably just worth adding there that, you know, we felt it really important to have mental health first aiders at every age and stage within the business, not just management, not just managers, because, you know, there's often situations where, you know, one, you know, one of the issues that you may wish to discuss is work. And that's why the guys asked me to step out of the, some of the wellness meetings because they're saying, you know, I, you know, I want to openly discuss my challenge, but what I don't want is Simon then going to speak to my boss and making an intervention in, in an inappropriate way because I'm involved in this environment. So, you know, making sure that you've got, you know, you know, guys and girls in their in their young, you know, in their twenties and and all the way through, you know, whether they're a warehouse operative or, or, you know, work in the office or in the sales team, we felt it was important to make sure that the entire workforce was represented in terms of resource. And, and you know, 
it, you know, certain challenges, you might be more comfortable speaking to somebody, you know, similar age, stage or gender to you, you know, it could be domestic abuse. You know, the idea of going to talk to your 55 year old male boss about domestic abuse is probably, you know, a barrier to, to you know, opening that discussion. And for us, having a spread across was, was a real focus around trying to remove the stigma around mental health and making sure that people in the business were recognized, you know, that they, they walk about with mental health first aid or high visits, they're highly visible <laughs> to, to, you know, everyone there and, and, and they are relatable. And I think that's important. But similarly, you know, when we talk about how we've built it into our strategy, Amanda talked about structure. We don't allocate specific numbers of hours a day or a week that the guys need to be doing this. We feel that it needs to be authentic, it needs to be genuine, it needs to be corridor conversations. You know, it, it's, it's conversations where it's not, I need to rush out, it's nine o'clock on Tuesday, I better go and do my hour's worth of mental health work. Um, it's not that, it, it's just being available and, and yeah, having, having a sort of natural environment to be able to open up, we feel is much more important than having a, a formal structure um, around that stuff. So it's about having, some structure and but also having you know that informal element where it's okay to you know to, to be having a chat with with somebody if they're needing a bit of help yeah and, and that, another interesting point i guess to build on um i'm going slightly off piece um how, how comfortable are your colleagues in talking about this because if you if you dial back i don't know pre-pandemic mental health was not a topic that was readily discussable in in a work context and and it feels that we've made such dramatic progress as a, as a nation and potentially as a you know as a global um, economy over the last uh, 12 14 months how, how comfortable now do you feel your workforce are at, 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 at being vulnerable i guess and admitting that they have a challenge or an issue well if you look at the sort of you know stereotypical positioning of a bloke in Glasgow um, you know the stereotype would suggest that they're not open to these types of discussions but actually we found very much the opposite that, that you know because it's so widely spoken about and um, because it's so visible around the business you know I'll give you an example of something that we do in almost every meeting that we have in the business regardless of the content is we have a the beginning of every meeting, the icebreaker is on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? And we go around the room and, and that is a way of, way of, you know, people being able to say, you know what, I'm a six or a five or, you know, I'm a nine. And at the beginning, when we started the process, everyone was a nine or a 10. But the more we do this, we're seeing lower numbers and those low numbers are, are a way of whether you wish to articulate the challenge at the time or not is by putting your hand up, listen, I'm a three today. You know, that's a prompt for other people around the room, your friends, whether or not they're mental health first aiders or just somebody that, that, that's your pal. Um, you know, it's a prompt for somebody to go and have a conversation and say, listen, you know, you, you said you were a three, you know, what are you struggling with? You know, how can I help? And if you can build that in, it, it, it breaks the stigma down in such a way that, that it, it's a natural thing to talk about now. You know, and Mando you know, let you know, give you an idea of how many interventions that we've made as, as a collective team in terms of supporting, but, but that would give you an idea of, of you know, the stigma breakdown that, that we've managed to create here. Yeah, no, that is impressive. I know Blake will have a similar um, strategy with their, with their meetings. You, you, you sort of express how you're feeling when you turn up to a meeting, which is brilliant as well. It, I think it's a really useful bit of context, isn't it? Just to, just to help people really um, open up themselves to a discussion, I guess, as you say, Simon, it's not about unburdening yourself publicly. It's just about raising a bit of a flag, isn't it? That there's an issue potentially that you would want to have some help and support around. Amanda, are there any specific examples that you want to give based on what Simon was highlighting? Yeah, so I, I think I'll touch on the interventions. So since August, we've had 31 interventions, which I think is a, a really encouraging number. Um, and what, what happens in that process is it can be a, a corridor chat that then leads to a, a sit down confidential conversation, for example, which then leads to them pin, um, signposting them to advice. But there's always a follow on, sometimes it's one, two or ongoing meetings and they've always got a support. 
what we've also introduced, um, which we've found useful for people uh, with a leave that have, uh, recently have been offered mental health concerns, and to get them back to work and feel comfortable coming back to work, the standard return to work process, if you've been off and you can feel anxious coming back to work potentially, uh, that's, you still have your, your standard return to work, but we have a, another return to work uh, with a mental health first aider, or a chat if you like, um, if they're happy with it and with the three of them. And it's the, the, the feedback is that they felt a lot more comfortable with the return to work process, um, which I think is something to consider in the business. It's something, as I say, we've started. Yeah, it's interesting. The, um, the, the building blocks to mental health that I spoke about, when you talked about the key elements, Amanda, that you're focusing in on, there's, there's almost an exact correlation. And the whole need that we have to connect with other humans, again, um, it is just coming through in, in how you're talking about the culture that you've created with, within the Phil Hill family. Um, if, if you look at the specific key elements that the team are focusing on, you gave us a few examples earlier about the sort of, uh, you know, the sort of sleep and exercise, meaningful activities. Any more examples of how you've used those, how you've developed those um, as, a, as a company, Amanda, that you can give just to bring it to life a bit? So um, mental health first aiders and managers, we did through, through the month um, quite a few ETO box talks. And again, going back to the stigma breakdown, we did the one to 10, continued to do the one to 10, it was improving. But what was really refreshing um, at, the, at that toolbox talk, we spoke about stress management, the employees started speaking to each other. And I said to Simon, I've never seen that before. And it was like, we started engaging with each other. Don't get me wrong, it was three or four of them, but that was a breakthrough, I feel, and it was a real improvement in the reduction of stigma. And I thought, you know, and since then, you see a wee bit more of it, and it's coming more and more. But people are feeling a lot more comfortable and what we have noticed um, from the stress management as well as the more engagement is, is really helping with reducing stress that they know it's okay to be okay there's people there's vulnerability we have managers that the one to ten they'll say you know i'm feeling i'm bored today we've got our ceo he'll say you know i'm a six it's okay and we eventually first they were all some would not even answer and they would be like oh i'm a nine i'm an eight now it's you know i'm a four i'm not feeling that great and are you okay Somebody will shout out and you're like, hey, this is great. So I think the stress management part is just ongoing for us. We, we're just trying to do everything within our culture to support our people. The engagement and communication was a big one for that. Um, a bit, the homeworkers was another big one where we we don't forget about homeworkers. I know people are, some people are coming back to work um, soon, hopefully, but homeworkers and like lunch over Zoom um, was popular. Um, we do like check in. So we did a who have you not spoke to in a while? So we did like a chain phone call where everyone phones someone. So we worked out a, a line of command, and maybe Simon will comment on this one a wee bit more for me. But <coughs> that was really popular. Do you want to pick up in that, Simon? Yeah. So I mean, sort of busy Wednesday afternoon, and you know, got my head in some numbers and different things. My phone rings, and it was one of the girls from the office, and you know, she phoned and. She said, you know, just ring to see how you are. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. What can I help you? And she said, no, no, I'm actually ringing to see how you are. And I thought, wow, okay. Um, you know, it was quite interesting just to, to take a step back. And, and you know, we talked a, a, about a lot of stuff, you know, about my family and some of the work pressures I'm having. And the summary, you know, I said, you know, why, why are you doing this? And she said, well, actually, it's really important for us that you're okay as, as the sort of leader of the business, that, that you're in a position that, that you're mentally strong. And, <clears throat> you know, Amanda talked about vulnerability and, and it's really important that, that the leadership teams are showing vulnerability, are opening up to their emotions because this is when it becomes authentic. Um, you know, some of you guys may know me, I'm possibly one of the most positive people you'll ever meet in your life. And, you know, my son was struggling with, with certain elements of mental health through lockdown. And, <clears throat> you know, he said to me, how come you're always happy? How come you're always chipper? We live in the same house and I'm feeling terrible and you're not. And it made me realize that I was, was being over positive. And, and we, you know, I use this phrase about avoiding toxic positivity because it's made me really think that, you know, sometimes we think, you know, as leaders, we need to G everybody up and, you know, get everybody energized. But actually there's a time where we don't. And, and, and that vulnerability and those check-ins, I think, is a really important thing for, 
you know, whether you're leading a business or managing a team, but, but that's certainly something that will um, accelerate engagement if, if, you know, the leaders and managers are being vulnerable. Yeah, no, that's, that is a, a really good build, Simon. Um, Elliot, you've asked a question and you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question or do you want me to ask it on your behalf? Yeah, no, thanks, Claire. Um, what Simon said just then, actually, about the importance of senior managers showing vulnerability, I think that's so spot on, actually, and, and is so rare to see as well. And it's leading by example. So even with all the flexible working stuff that we were doing for, for years, it's important for the senior managers to, you know, show, show an interest in leaving early to collect the kids and leading by example. And the same applies to the mental health. Anyway, my question is, how do you do this while being aware of time? So we want to care about our employees and make them feel safe and warm and it, that they're in a, a safe place to work. But when you ask someone how they are, it can open a real can of worms and it can be time consuming. And they, once you open that, you can't just close it. So how, how do we manage that? Well, that's that's a really interesting question. And if, um, you know, if one of your family came to you, Ella, and said, I'm not feeling too well, and you had a deadline for work, and you had to sit there for three hours with them, you would, right? And then you would work late, or you would work at a way of catching up. This is about priorities. Um, you know, and it's not about a two-hour conversation every day. Um, you know, Amanda would, would give you a good example of an intervention that actually happened last week or the week before where, where it required additional support from other mental health guys. So we share the burden around. It's not about, you know, whispering about people's challenges, but where somebody has a specific need or help, you know, shout for help, then, then you muscle around them and, and that other stuff becomes less important. It's a shame that, you know, we might be one picker down for an hour, but do you know what? This stuff is way more important than, than, than that. And we can work out how we catch up on some of that other stuff. So it is about prioritizing. Um, you know, people know what job they need to do. They know what work they have to do. But that emotional engagement is the thing that makes us a business that, that we believe is unique, that, that we actually care about each other. And it's not just a transactional process of support. So, you know, time is a challenge. And, and where these things do require um more time you know we're not psychologists we're not specialists in specific subjects so there is a path of support where the mental health first aiders will then direct individuals often the first step is encouraging them to meet with their gp but also looking you know online for resources you know what charities can can you pick up the phone to who have spe specific skills in that specific challenge so so the role is very much about you know, listening and understanding and, and more listening than talking and, and, and then knowing the next step and the direction within that workflow. And Amanda's got that well documented for the guys as a resource. And it would be something that, that would be fantastic for the FWD to do is build a resource network of, of different charities and different places to go that colleagues can be directed to, whether that's about you know, substance dependency or domestic abuse or eating disorders, it'd be a really positive thing for the FWD to be able to have that everyone knows where we can go and find these resources. So I'm sure we can we can pick up with Nikki and, and David and James to see if we can we can build that. Superb yeah. answer. Thank you, Simon. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, a point you mentioned early on, Sino, was about communication and how you cascade this down the, the company. Can you give um, give an example of how well that works? How well do you cascade down, I guess, the communication, but I guess the support as well and sort of share ideas, best practice across across your family? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start, but, but essentially we've created specific message boards um, in staff areas for mental health. You know, you can't put a, you know, a, a health and safety poster on that space. It's specifically designated towards that. Um, Amanda's created, um, you know, a, a mental health calendar. So there's a theme every month. Um, in our monthly core briefs, then the managers brief to everybody, mental health and well-being. Um, there's discussions. You know, everyone gets updated in, in what the themes are because. 
typically you're not, um, you know, you know, issues with um, teenage depression is not an issue for, you know, somebody that maybe doesn't have teenagers. So there's there's different things that relate to different people, but that cascade mechanism happens through our daily, weekly, and, and monthly briefs. Amanda, do you want to just give a little bit more context on that? So as, as Simon says, we have a calendar and we try and focus in what we're doing each month and in, in, uh, in line with the calendar. Um, but we communicate that out through our wellness team, we'll communicate out through our, our core briefers and communication. But we also have a closed Facebook group as well. And we are looking to have an app um, in place where people can go on and get information direct. So for example, our closed Facebook group just now they can go on and they'll have links to our sleep Zoom if they can't make it. They'll get all the information about our step challenges, how we're doing, encouraging, encouraging people. We're just trying to use all sources because not everyone likes social media, so not everybody will look at a notice board. But we're trying to use every communication channel that we can. Um, and then if, if anyone misses out or will take learnings from it, but so far somebody communicates if it's not verbally, we'll see it on a notice board on one of our socials. Some, some amazing examples of how um, deeply embedded it really does feel across uh, the, the entire Fields Hill um, company. How, how do you measure success? How do you know that all these fantastic initiatives are, are, are working, are, are helping, um, are supporting your colleagues and, and you know, creating that, that culture that you're wanting to create? In this world, um, businesses want to be able to provide measurement in facts, figures, and numbers. This is about a feeling, a vibe. You know, I, listen, I've been involved in the wholesale sector for over 20 years, and I've never seen an initiative that has brought a workforce together uh, under one objective than this. Everybody's into it, everyone's engaged in it. So, so we don't have a specific measurement. Of course, Amanda talked about the number of interventions that have been made and guys have been supported, but for me, it's just about driving depth and depth of relationship with, with our staff and, and making sure that we all know that we're here and in it together. You know, I always say that there's nobody better in a crisis than the Phil Shield team because, you know, we had people waiting in three feet snow to get to work during the Beast from the East a few years ago because they knew our customers needed help. It, it, it's just ingraining that culture and driving depth in, in, in that, that business for families movement. But... You no, know, of course, you want to try and measure things. You know, how much time? We, we've got no idea how much time all our mental health first aiders are spending doing this. And actually, I don't really I don't really mind how much time they're spending because it's adding value in an emotional space, not just a transactional space, which I think is important. I and mean, for me, the, the stigma breakdown is a big one. Yeah. When you see from the start of the journey to where we are now and we'll continue, um, you can see that people are more comfortable with coming forward asking for help. You see managers who look and say, you know, I think um, X needs a bit of support. Um, would you mind looking into that or trying to engage with them? And it's just coming together. We're not where we need to be. We'll continue and we'll learn and we'll learn to others and keep getting feedback and trying. But the stigma um, is, for me, is a thing I can see it really re reducing. How do you see everything you're doing uh, radiate out from you to your customers? Um, and all your suppliers, I guess, because it really does feel that the um, the support network you're creating, the unique culture you're creating, has to then, in a ripple effect, start benefiting your 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 customers, your community, your suppliers. How how does that how does that um, sort of flow through um, grow? How how are you seeing that manifest? Well, happy colleagues make happy customers, right? So, so that I guess that's the first bit, but. Listen, we're not shy in, in shouting about this stuff. Um, you know, a number of our um, sales team are mental health first aiders, and actually staff in some of our customer shops have reached out to them and said, hey, listen, so we actually see this as something that, that we could help extend into our customer base. And what training could we give each individual in every key store that we had in terms of this? You know, you think about how many touch points a local community store has with the community. If there was a formally trained mental health first aider in that environment, it could add some, some significant value in that helping others space. It could add some significant value in, in you know, 
you know, that community well-being. And I, I think there's no doubt that, that it can extend. Um, in terms of our suppliers, um, we've been articulating our, our strategy to, to our top 30 core suppliers. And they, they are fully aware of, of our objectives and, and are very supportive of, you know, what we're doing. And many of them are asking, well, how can we help? You know, how can, you know, we do some stuff together, you know? exercise you know we did a we did a, a, a hill walk you know for charity with jti a couple of years ago and you know it's cool fun stuff that, that we can all do together it doesn't need to be overly structured but yeah i think you know listen we don't know all about this stuff and and everyone will have a different way in which it works for them and you know i think the idea of this session was really to try and you know articulate some of the stuff we're doing but Listen, we'd love to hear other people's ideas and thoughts about, about what they're doing um, because there's no exact science to this. It's just, you know, a, a slightly a slightly different way for different businesses. But if there's any successes coming out there, we'd love to hear about them because we'll give it a go. And because every decision gets made in this, you know, in this building and we can make a decision now and implement it this afternoon, that, that gives us flexibility. We're not shackled by huge structures in our business which which i guess allows us to be fast on our feet and i guess if i were to give any business on here a bit of advice is no matter how political your business is and how many layers of structure there is you know this has to be fluid it can't just be you know we're going to do this and we're going to build it over over a period of time it's got to be fluid and you've got to be able to adapt quickly there's a, an interesting idea there, Simon, um, as, you, as you speak about um, how we to be flexible and learn from, from each other. I think that there is potentially a role that we can ask the FWD to help with in terms of sharing ideas and best practice across the industry, because I think the wholesale industry is quite unique in having um, so many family businesses within its culture. So how, how we do share ideas and best practice as, as an industry that benefits the entire industry could be a really interesting opportunity for for the FWD to think about. Um, I've, I've had an interesting question through from Frankie that I will ask. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, we, the, the interventions that you've spoken about, how, how they, they work well in a warehouse environment. Um, how well do they translate to your teams in support functions where you may not have as much visibility? How have you adapted your approach, I guess, across support functions as well as in the warehouse? Um, so basically, because we have a widespread of um, mental health first aiders across the business in all departments and areas, um, they can spot in different, so at, at all um, parts are involved, so all our communications go to everyone in the business, not just our warehouse, all our toolbox talks, talks go out, um, our core briefers go out, all information, so we don't leave any parts of our business out, it's all um, part of um, any communications, if that makes sense. And I think having a mental health first aider in, a, in so for, for example, our sales team or in the office, they can pick up and they can observe or if, if, if somebody needs to jump in with support, they can see it. Simon, you can add anything else to that? Yeah, just, I, I suppose, you know, I guess the homeworkers you referenced earlier, you know, we have a, you know, a, a Friday lunch um, where people just get together and have a chat and, you know, it might be about work, it might not be about work, it might be about football, you know, having different, using technology, I guess, is a way of, of reaching out, but I guess we're all getting a bit tired of these Zoom things and a bit Zoom fatigued, and we've got to just keep energising this stuff, and not just having them for the sake of having them. Um, you know, the guys are saying, listen, you know, can we do these a little less frequently, um, you know, make it every couple of weeks, so... Yeah, it's just about adapting and using every bit of communication technology, whether it's physical or, or virtual, where you can. And I guess it's what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Good example. Thanks for your question, Frankie. Um, it, it is interesting. If you, if you read, again, quite a lot that is now being talked about in, in, the, in the general industry, it is about companies with a purpose um, now being far more sought after, people want to work for a company um, that they feel that they belong and that they feel that they can align behind instead of it purely being commercial. And I guess that, that relates to people making some, some choices about what's important to them over the last 12, 14 months um, and, and really valuing the small things, I guess, like, you know, the, the family and your health and things that you probably take for granted. So I think you've articulated that, that fantastically well. 
Um, what what advice would you give, um, condensing it all down, if if possible, to others that want to start on on this journey or or create their own plan from from the, the thinking that you've given? How, where where would you start? Like all these things, it starts with your culture. So so it's making sure that you're creating an authentic culture of we genuinely care, not that we should be doing this to take the CSR box. If you're thinking that way, don't do it because your staff won't engage in it anyway. Um, you know, so that that culture and, and you know, making it make making the responsibility sit with the individuals, you know. You'll have an amazing amount of enthousi enthusiastic individuals that would love to give some time to this type of project. You know, in a business like ours, you know, it's difficult, you know, to move through the business because nobody ever leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we try and create a number of different projects that, that people can do outside of outside of their, their day job to keep them engaged and keep them um interested so there will be enthusiasm and, and let the team take ownership of it you know create an environment of structure but keep it informal I think is is you know where we've seen seen some success and I, I guess you know Amanda referenced it earlier the enthusiasm of the team all of a sudden I suppose refer you know references back to Ella's question about time you know, all of a sudden we've got a million good ideas and we're doing them all before the end of next week. And, and we just got to be careful that, that we're, we're, we're not boiling the ocean, that we're trying to just structure it in such a way that it can be done at a pace that, that will guarantee success rather than guaranteeing failure if you try and do too much. So, um, you know, I think, listen, leadership guys being vulnerable, I think, is really, really important. and and. You know, any good business, all the leaders will understand that and try and build this into your formal objectives within your business in the same way that you may want to increase revenue or profit or availability or efficiency. Try and factor, you know, wellness into to some of your, your objectives so that it's always at front of mind when, when people are focusing because typically when you've got a few things to focus on, other things get forgotten. So <clears throat> I guess it's about keeping some structure, um, but, but making it informal within that structure that you've created. You'd add to that, Amanda. Just an, an important watch out, I think, would be for your mental health first aiders to ensure you check in with them. Um, so and how they're feeling, because we've had, they've dealt with quite a few serious issues um, and, and and it does affect them. Um, one didn't sleep for a few nights, they were really anxious. So it's just about making sure you check in with them as well. They're doing a great job. They're really helping um, others, but just make sure they're okay. Uh, something we, we do as a regular check-in, but just really how are you? And just making sure they're okay, just to remember that. Yeah, no, that is a, that is a really good build, isn't it? I think sometimes it's difficult to um, understand the impact that trying to help other people can sometimes have on you if you're really yeah. caring about how they feel it, it, it can be a challenge can't it specifically if you're not you know you're not as trained as a mental health professional could be in the outside world yeah. so you take on the burden of trying to help everybody it, it can be a challenge can't it that's yes. a good build and um, we've had a question that I'm going to have to ask exactly as it is because I don't fully understand it because I don't know what an EAP system would be but do you have an EAP system and how do you use it to your to its full potential? Yeah, so yeah, we've got a couple that we use. So it's um, um what does EAP stand for, Amanda? Sorry for my ignorance. Employee Assisted Program. Brilliant. So where we can then refer um through that. So we've got one through our retail, retail trust, um, and we've also got grocery aid that we use. Um, but there's I was on a call with another business last week and they've recommended we are wellbeing is another one so that's three um, that, that you could be involved with um, and they give you a, a lot of free advice and information and if it's debt, domestic abuse and um, a big one is a thing called COOF which is for a mental health for children um, and it's been really we've used that a few times um, and get really good feedback on it so we've had quite a few interventions for employees children and their mental health especially in lockdown um, and we've used COOF. So yeah, to your question, there is quite a few, um, a retail trust, grocery aid, and 
the we are wellbeing looks good. I'm looking into that one. Brilliant, thank you. And, and I can see Frankie's also confirmed that grocery grade are fantastic. Um, and you life also is an option. So yes, great. Um, Simon, I want to ask you personally, what, what specifically have you um, learned yourself over the last 12, 14 months? It feels like you have enabled the company to go on quite an accelerated journey. How, what, what have you learned yourself? How, how's it been for you? Um, you know, listen, I think what we've learned is kind of stuff we already knew that our people are pretty awesome and, and you know, prepared to go that extra mile, you know. So, you know, things you learn is more about the things that, that, that you kind of already knew. Um, you know, from my perspective, you know, how well the, the team have responded to continuous change in government requirements and, and not moaning about it, just getting on with it and just reflecting and, you know, accepting that, that we're all doing this stuff for the right reason. And, you know, that message of, you know, this isn't just about looking after you guys that work here, it's the three or four dependents that you have in your family, you know, so, so actually it's not just about us protecting you and us as a business, but actually we think we've got a couple of hundred people here. There's maybe a thousand people that, that are actually reliant on us being super compliant to, to process. And, you know, so that, that's been, been a great reminder of, of how well the, the team have responded. And, um, you know, it has been about focus, you know, so, you know, we've been going along trying to get into different parts of the trade and different parts of the sector. And actually what it's made us do is just as part of the strategy, just pull back and go, what is it we're going to be absolutely world class at? And that that's kind of, you know, what, what it's kind of done to me. I've got quite an entrepreneurial mindset and, you know, it's, you know, often the guys are going, listen, you know, that's great, but how are we going to do this and who's going to do it? And it's, it's helped us really focus on, on, you know, innovating around the stuff that we've, we've targeted to do and grow as a business. And, you know, the other thing, I guess, is about enhanced communication. You know, it's one thing that everybody moans about when, you know, there's, there's a problem of communication is terrible. You hear it in every single business, but, you know, you can't communicate enough. We're communicating more than we ever have. Um, one, because of safety and requirement, but two, because of, you know, the, the need to continuously engage in, in, in uncharted territory. You know, the, the mental health pandemic is, is the next pandemic that's coming and, and we need the government to, to really recognize that and step up and realize that this is going to be a, a, a problem. And how do they support employers to really accelerate this, this stuff collectively? Is, great that one or two of us are doing some stuff and it'd be brilliant to get everybody up but I definitely feel that the governments need to you know step up and you know their support of of people that look after lots of people i.e employers um needs to needs to be there so yeah I think there's lots of learnings um you know you never stop learning I guess but um yeah it's it's, it's been an interesting experience for us our business has had a positive experience out of COVID. I know that there's a lot that have had, you know, much more difficult experiences and the approach to mental health may be slightly different because when you're battling to, to get your business survival or get business going, you know, it must be massively overwhelming to think, how are we going to focus on two of these things? So, so I think, you know, listen, Amanda and I are here to, to, pick up the phone with anybody that, that's maybe looking for a little bit of help in terms of some of the stuff that we've done here. If any of your teams that aren't on this call are, are keen to, to, to phone, then yeah, our numbers are out there. So drop us a message on LinkedIn or, or, or you know, give us a call. Fantastic. I've got two questions from two Julies for you. Um, the, the first, um, Amanda, I think is, is perfect for you. Um, and that's all about, um, on the speed mentoring session, you spoke about the importance of sleep. Um, and Julie wants to understand um, how your pillow initiative is going. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the ideas that the guys came up with, um, you know, around sleep, everyone's got rubbish pillows, right? So one of the things we're looking at is, um, is buying everyone a new pillow <laughs> within the business. So we've got Colin Espy um, doing a Zoom call. Um, Colin's got a, a, a business called Sleepio. Um, so on the back of on the back of that, we're going to get some recommendations from him and look to roll out um, 
roll out of that. But listen, sleep is so important for everybody. If you've had a good sleep, you're going to have a reasonable day. If you've had a bad sleep, you're starting on the back foot. So we know that that's important. And yeah, just trying to trying to give guys ideas about how to sleep better and maybe not be looking at your phone or playing a video game just before you're trying to get to sleep or, you know, flicking through LinkedIn that often many of us do late at night. I think, you know, things that are stimulating your mind when you're supposed to go to sleep is kind of obvious, but we all still do it. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that session with Colin. Brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, I, I, one of the things that I spoke about on my session a couple of weeks ago was habits and how do you focus in on creating positive habits that help your mental health resilience um, and little things like that. Exactly as you say, Simon, it's, it's just knowing that being on social media late into the evening isn't a good thing. So how do you create that sort of positive habit that helps you then sleep better or helps you go to bed on a frame of mind that is restful? Some of those some of those little tweaks can be really, really positive. Um, a question from um, another Julie. Um, this is about uh, when restrictions ease and, and, and people can return to the office. Um, what impact or how are you dealing with people that could have mental health challenges on returning, I guess, to normal? Um, what support are you giving to, to, to help people re return to the office or to, the, to, to a more normal, less um, protected environment? So for anyone returning to work in general, we'll be returning, we're going to have training. So it'll be a training on returning and adapting back in the workplace. Um, so that'll be an e-learning. Um, they'll, they'll see our current risk assessments, but they'll also get engagement and everything that we've been doing from a mental health point of view. So, but prior to that, if we're aware um, through returning to work that there is a mental health issue or concern, we would offer the first aid to have a meeting with them similar to the return to work if they were offered absence. Um, if we're not aware of it and then we come back to work and then we see that we're doing all this engagement and hopefully the stigma and that they know that they can come forward or somebody spots it and, and they do the one to 10 and it's identified that way. But we do have some um, uh, things in place in terms of training uh, for coming back to work because we are aware um, that people will be anxious because, you know, we noticed that on some of the calls, they would say after we did our Zooms that they were exhausted because, you know, they, they don't do teams regularly. Some people didn't, you know, they, you know it, or they're not used to that's the face-to-face. -face. They do teams all the time, sorry. So when they do the face-to-face, -face, it's quite exhausting. And um, so, which I can relate to sometimes, you, you think, you know, I've not spoke to my, my granny in ages. And then after that, you're like, well, that was, that was, that was hard going. But it's great and to, be, to be getting back into that place, I think will really help. Fantastic. I think my eyes have got dramatically worse as well. So I think there's going to be a load of people putting glasses on that never used to have glasses on before because of the amount of online time we've spent. Um, we, we've four minutes left. Are there any final questions anyone wants to ask? Um, clearly we will, as, as Simon mentioned earlier on, be looking at how we can put all the resources um, that we have available through Philsill as well as through Women in Wholesale onto the FWD website. So we will be pooling all the information that we've got to give some best practice sharing opportunities. Um, any other questions um, anyone would like to ask, then feel free. Um, any closing thoughts from you, Simon, um, as, we, as we wrap up? Um, don't do nothing. So if you're going to do something, do, do, do one thing. Whatever that might be, it will probably help somebody. So, you know, we've talked about this. As, you know, we've been doing it a few months. We're very committed to it. I appreciate that maybe not every business might be able to be as committed to this type of stuff as we can, as we are. So... Listen, do something, you know, have some conversations with your boss, have some conversations with the people around the business. But listen, every good business is, is desperately keen to get feedback from their colleagues about how they make it better. And yeah, the, you know, do something is, is, is the advice that, that I'd maybe give you in terms of that. But as I said earlier, I've never, you know, if, if you're speaking to your boss or somebody that needs convincing of this, as I said earlier, I've never been involved in an initiative that's brought a workforce together quite like this. So, you know, there's some endorsement there. And if you felt it would help me speaking to, to your boss or whoever, then I'd be happy to do it. But um, yeah, I think do something would be my advice. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Simon and Amanda, you've been absolutely incredible and, and really inspiring in terms of how you've embraced the challenge and came up with some, I think, leading um, ideas and the culture that you're creating absolutely, I think, is, is going to be world class. Um, Elliot, do you want to, to close in our final minutes? Yeah. Um, Simon, Amanda, thank you so much. That was 
that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I will do something, Simon. You've inspired me. Um, I, I'm going to start a. I'm going to start a blog in our company at JJ's, a JJ Achievers blog or a JJ Champions blog, just because people like to be made to feel good, right? So I'm going to ask everyone to nominate someone that's done something good and we'll feature them on our blog and it will make them feel warm and fuzzy. It will, hopefully it will. I'm gonna do something. Thank you, Simon. That was absolutely superb. Thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, our next breakfast briefing will happen in uh, a month. If you'd like to know what it is and stay up to date, just make sure you're registered to our newsletter. And that's it. Thanks, every thanks very much. Brilliant, well done. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. See you.